Don't try to sneak into your room like that. I know what you've got behind your back. Records. More no records. Oh, hi there. I know that for good health, uh, I should be listening to at least six albums, six vinyl albums every day. But, but who's got time? I just don't have time for that. And that's why I take new Nature's PVC. Nature's PVC contains up to six albums that have been powdered and put into a capsule. I just swallow two Nature's PVC every day and I have the equivalent of having listened to six LPs every day. I recommend New Nature's PVC. And now there's New Nature's PVC with jellyfish. Yes, it's guaranteed to have two jellyfish albums crushed up and powdered and put into a capsule. That way it will improve your memory too. So try Nature's PVC and Nature's PVC with jellyfish. Thank you. This will be the deepest dive into Who's Next that you'll see on the internet, I'm pretty sure of that. So I got back from the Making Vinyl and the Vinyl Alliance meeting in the Netherlands with, with COVID. So I'm just getting over COVID, so I'm a little bit woozy, but I really wanted to get this a video done for you. So let's talk about Who's Next. I'm not gonna go through the whole history of the Lifehouse project of Pete Town since that was the origination of this record. Um, you can find all of that online. I'll do a little bit of that coming up, but let's just talk about the record itself that came out. So a lot of people know about the details of this record, uh, but when I talk to people and say, so Baba O'Reilly, what, what is that? A lot of people don't know um, what Baba O'Reilly even means. And I know that for a fact because I talk to people and they, they don't know. They love the song, everybody loves the song, but what, what does it mean? So, Pete Townsend was a, uh, a follower of Baba Mayer, and uh, this is a record that the Baba Mayer Society distributed in Berkeley, California. Personally, I never followed anybody. I guess it's a good thing to give yourself over to somebody. I mean, I followed a lot of musicians as musicians, but I never... Uh, religion isn't isn't a big thing for me. At any rate, th this is uh, a it's a there's a booklet in here about Mayor Baba and his um, spiritualism, like, and um, it's got artwork that's reminiscent of Tommy actually in in some ways. And then there's a record inside, and the record includes uh, uh, evolution. Some of the songs you probably know, music by Peter Townsend, music by Ronnie Lane. And then it turns uh, out that one of uh, Mayor Baba's favorite songs was uh, Cole Porter's Begin to Begin. That's the Baba part of Baba O'Reilly. He was a very charismatic guy. I guess if I was a follower of any people in this realm, it would be, uh, it would be uh, Gurdjieff. I, I, I read a lot of books about Gurdjieff. He was a rascal and a really interesting character. And, uh, and that led me to Ospensky, and I read that, and that kind of changed my life because Ospensky saw the universe as, uh, and Gurdjieff saw the universe as vibrations, and everything is notes, everything we see is notes. It's, it's really interesting. It's worth reading even if you don't take LSD, it's, but it's especially worth reading if you do. I'm not advocating any drug. Okay, let me stop. <laughs> I'm not advocating you take any drugs whatsoever, but, or mushrooms, but they're good. Okay, so uh, that's the... Uh, the Baba part of O'Reilly, and then the O'Reilly part is is Terry Riley, and here's a uh, Terry Riley and see a really interesting record. You're seeing the reflection of my light. I know I should get a better light, but I don't have a better light for now, so it's just the way it goes. And that's the Riley part, and this is a really cool record. And look, it's two dollars and ninety eight cents I paid for this record back when nobody wanted vinyl. It was such a great period of time before. Now everybody wants vinyl, and you can go online and find out what everything's selling all over the world from from Discogs. Good for Discogs, but you know this was this record came from a radio station, and believe me, <laughs> they never played this record at a radio station, so it's in mint condition. And if they did play it at a radio station, uh, either it was never played a second time, 
or uh, the person who played it got fired. There's no other way. And it was one of these crappy short pack. Oh, it came apart. I'm so surprised. This is when the label said, we could save some money by really crapping out the packaging and doing this. So, yeah, this is Unipack. These were the Unipack. So, uh, you have to have your glue gun or your methacrylators or whatever you use to put these records back together after you open it up. All right, so that's Terry Riley. And, and this one also, this, is, this one's really, really great. This is uh, Terry Riley, A Rainbow and Curved Air. Definitely recommend getting a hold of these records if you can. They're uh, minimalist and, and repetitive and drone-like and really fun. So that's where Baba O'Reilly, the name of the song, came from. So here's the, this is the original Decca pressing. Uh, and this came out in August of 1971. And uh, <clears throat> I remember buying it when it came out at New England Music City and or Cheap Thrills. I don't remember which one. And what's really interesting about this is uh, it sounded terrible. I remember after having luxuriated over Tommy, the, I mean, the UK track pressing of Tommy, uh, recorded at a small studio. I mean, not even at a big studio, but the sound of... Uh, of that record was spectacular, especially Keith Moon's drum kit. The sound of his drum kit on that record was... And the sound of the drums on this record, on this pressing especially, it just had, it was... I mean, as a Glenn Johns knew how to engineer, but for some reason, it sounded terrible. So, going back, uh, going back now and playing all of these different pressings, the first thing you notice is how bad this sounds. There's no bottom end. There's no top end. It's very murky in the mid-range. Uh, imaging is cloudy and hazy. And it doesn't sound very good. There's no credit for who mastered it, but you'll see. I think, I think Doug Sachs did this, which, which blows my mind, but we'll get to that later. Um, Pete Townsend had a relationship with Doug Sachs that goes back right to the beginning. It was everything you buy. Um, from The Who or Pete Townsend was mastered by the great and late Doug Sachs, uh, one of many of our uh, mastering heroes in, in the world of records. And even if you buy a, like a British pressing or some other pressing, it's going to be mastered by Doug Sachs because that is the individual that Pete Townsend trusted with his recordings um, for good reason. But this one, for whatever reason, it just sounds awful. Here's an original... British pressing of who's next. Okay, I have this was so I got this for six pounds at the record ex, the music and video exchange at Notting Hill Gate. Six pounds when nobody wanted to buy records. You could go to the UK, you could go to Notting Hill Gate, or you could go to music you know the music and and video exchange, or you could go to the like Rough Trade in, in Islington, and you could just buy <clears throat> up records for almost nothing. But this is a very early pressing. And you look on the inner groove area, and you'll see uh, Bilbo is uh, the mastering engineer, who's Dennis Blackham at IBC Studios. He cut a lot of great, great records in this period of time. And this is one of the great ones. And when you hear this record, compared to that terrible American Decca, you, you'd immediately know one, one is great, and one is not. And what this record has that the other one doesn't is punchy bass and... Uh, really extended highs and clarity to the transients and good dynamics and uh, image specificity like you want to hear on any record whether it's rock or classical or whatever it just sounds good a big nice nice spread of images clean it's great you'd immediately hear the difference as opposed to the American one which was bulbous and boring so this is this is the first pressing, which has um, the the Polydor in red there. Okay, sounds great. If you want to hear a great copy of uh, Who's Next, find one of these. I don't know what it goes for now on uh, Discogs or wherever because um, I don't need one. I got one. This is a second press from Polydor. It doesn't have that red thing on the bottom but it's very very close and uh, this one I also got very inexpensively made in Great Britain 
and this one has Bilbo on it too, but it's a it's a different Bilbo. It's it's written it's, it's obviously a different and later um, cut, and uh, this one has Bilbo in larger larger print. The, and this one sounds great. It's it's more open on top. It doesn't have the I mean the drum kicks. The kick drum on that original one are really slamming intense. On this one, a little bit lighter in the kick drums, but the top end is more open. They're both great. Uh, you know, which I like better, I, I don't know. Depends how much, how good the bass is on your system and whether your system needs more slam on the bottom or not. Whatever. It's still great. And that's the second UK press. Also, highly recommended. And the number of this is uh, 2408102 Deluxe. Both of, both of them are. You cannot go wrong with this pressing. Now, as far as I know, uh, I don't know whether there were any other reissues uh, until uh, 1995. Now, in 1995, just when vinyl was disappearing and uh, you couldn't buy records in record stores anymore, pretty much, and you couldn't buy records on the Internet because that hadn't, the, that hadn't happened yet where you could just buy stuff on the Internet. The Internet had barely happened. But uh, an executive at MCA decided that there should be a vinyl resurgence. And, uh, and that was at a time that I was screaming about vinyl. I mean, I had stopped plucking chickens, and I decided to, to scream about vinyl. And so someone at MCA got a hold of me and said, look, we're going we're gonna to put out these heavy vinyl records, and we'd like you to get involved. Would you like to write liner notes for them? And we'll also uh, we'll send you uh, lacquers to, to tell us if you think it's sounding good. And so I the heavy vinyl series from MCA was put in, in into uh, production, even though there was no place to sell the records. So it didn't it didn't do too well. But let me let me show you the the lacquer. So here's the lacquer of of who's next. And I'll show you a couple of interesting things about that. So cut by Kevin Gray at Future Disc. So here's. Here's side one, and you know what? It still sounds fantastic, even after all these years. And you can see there's a little bit of mold growing on it. I played it last night in this demo to get these all these different versions clocked in, and it sounds great. Here's my report. I wrote it up, and then I, I faxed it to them, I think. I kept this. So, so that's the lacquer of that version, and here's the finished record. You may have seen this in the store. You may be able to still get a copy of this. And uh, they quote me at the top here. It says, um, Music erupts out of total silence from these thick 180-gram virgin vinyl discs with a velvety smoothness, spaciousness, and ultra-high resolution that stuns even the most committed CD diehard. I loved writing that, and I loved having it on the, on the sticker, the hype sticker on the front. And then below that, it said, remastered directly from the original analog master tapes. No noise suppression or bass roll-off. Pressed on 180-gram virgin vinyl, deluxe inner sleeves, original artwork, and liner notes. And I'll show you that. So, this was done around the same time that uh, Wired magazine was getting uh, big. And they had just published a story that's called Being Digital. So, I wrote the inner liner notes right here. This is after I stopped plucking chickens. And, uh, I'm sorry, I can't help. I'm making a joke. Okay, some people get so upset that I make a joke. I make a joke. Um, so this is Michael Farmer, editor of The Tracking Angle, when it was a magazine, contributing editor at, at my previous uh, endeavor. And I wrote these notes, which you'll have to get a copy to see the notes, but I'm very, I'm very proud of having done this and being involved in it. And when I played uh, this record and the lacquer, uh, I will tell you, it is at least as good, if not better, than the original British pressing. It is. It, the original British pressing is great. This thing's got more slam. It, it's Kevin Gray cutting it on a good system. And so it's got more slam. It's got a better, wider soundstage better image focus. It, it really opened up and sounds sounded great. If you can get a hold of one of these, uh, you'll be happy. And I'm sure they're around. Because nobody could buy them when they came out because you couldn't buy records anymore. Here's an interesting thing. So, so they went and they did the gatefold thing with different pictures. So here's the inner picture. Uh, I want you to look a uh, 
Look where Peter Townsend has his hand. What? Peter? It's on Roger's Peter, actually. He's got his hand right in his crotch. What is going on there? Okay, I wonder, I wonder why. I forgot the name of the executive who, who, who okayed all this, but why did he allow that picture? Was he, I don't, whatever. Anyway, if you can get a hold of a copy of this one and the, the number, it's MCA uh, 11164. Sounds great. All right, that was 1995. Okay, fast forward to 2003. This version came out, uh, and this version is really interesting. This is a three-record set, and uh, the sound. In it, this is remixed, produced, and engineered by Andy McPherson and John Gas Gasly. Astley, I'm sorry, John, I mispronounced your name, but most of what you do is pretty ghastly. I'm sorry. Um, this one, what's good about this, and you know, and John Astley is is Pete Townsend's ex-brother-in-law, and I can't get into the whole familial Michigas, but anyway, uh, I got to tell you what I think. Right, I'm not, I'm not going to hold back. What's fascinating about this is, first, it's got, um, it's got the original record, uh, and the original. Mixed. I don't think they messed with it. And it's got six tunes on side one, and then three songs on side two, plus uh, the New York Record Plant session where they recorded "Baby Don't You Do It," which is which is a you know a Motown song, a Marvin Gaye song that that the Who did a lot live in concert. But it's got Leslie West playing guitar. Some of you know about this stuff, so I'm not, it's not like I'm telling you anything that you don't know. Uh, and that's it's fun to have that. And what's really good about this version is that there's annotation for every track that, that, that Pete wrote. I call him Pete because we're in first name basis with each other. No, we're not. We never met. And he probably doesn't ever want to meet me after this, but it's okay. Uh, so there's details here about each track that uh, are really interesting. Let's see if it, any of these things I can read to you. No, I'm not going to. I can't stand here and read to you. It's not going to work. Uh, and then... Disc two has alternate versions of things recorded at the record plant, um, and like Pure and Easy, which ends up, ended up on Odds and Sods, and it's got uh, Al Cooper on organ behind Blue Eyes. The original version was recorded at the record plant on 1718 March 1991. Uh, anyway, there's all kinds of interesting little extras on this, and there's the master tape of side two, and you can see it says Mastering Lab right there again. It says File at the Mastering Lab, and this Lacquer Master 71071, and if Doug Sachs cut the original Decca record, uh, I don't know where he cut it, because it, it doesn't, have, doesn't have TML on it. I'm not sure he had the Mastering Lab at that point. He was just probably cutting someplace else, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but I don't know. But uh, it wasn't very good. And um, Interestingly, it says here, you won't, won't get fooled again, azimuth change. Obviously, some of these tracks were recorded in different studios, different places, so uh, on different machines. So when they put it all together and assembled it, there were azimuth changes, obviously. So it's a warning here that uh, changes had to be made in, in, in the mastering. So that, that's one. And then the other side is also here. Let me, I'll, pull that, I'll pull that out for you. This, that's, this is the side one on the tape. So, NAB non-Dolby. There's also an essay in here about, about the, <clears throat> the Lifehouse project by a fellow named John Atkins. Goes on for both sides. And, you know, that's a history you, you can look up online. I'm not going to get into it. It, it's, it's, it was a very ambitious project, obviously. But, uh, it was almost like artificial intelligence that Pete Townsend thought of artificial thought of artificial intelligence like decades before we we have it. And right now, talking to you, uh, still feeling like COVID, uh, I feel like my intelligence is artificial right now too. Okay, so that's this version. Sonically, the actual original record is not great on this. It's 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 obviously a digital file. It's glassy and hard sounding and not very good. All right. Next up. 
we have the Classic Records version. This came out in uh, 2005, and no doubt, this one, I think copies go for four to five hundred dollars now. And let's see, this was cut by Chris Bellman, and this is, to me, another one to have. I mean, the heavy vinyl one that Kevin cut is great. This is also great. I think they're equally good. Uh, if you want to get a great copy of Who's Next, uh, you could get this one and, and you'd be very, very, very happy. Now, one of the interesting things that we know, when they are cutting, when they have the tape out and they're cutting at 33, they also um, almost always cut at 45. So we know that Chad Kasim has purchased classic records and he's got a lot of metal parts from classic records so I hope he gets the rights now, and that, now that this new version has come out from Universal I hope Chad also gets the rights to release the classic records cut from Chris Bellman at 33 and Wish of Wish would be a 45 RPM UHQR because this is really great, but a 45 UHQR of Who's Next would be the bomb, I'm sure. This was mastered by John Astley and um, cut half speed from a digital file by Miles Showell. And honestly, also, it comes with this in it. I don't know, this was not in my original. This, like, inner sleeve with headhunters. I don't, I've never seen this. Maybe I, maybe I, my original isn't really original. Maybe my original had this thrown out, but I don't, I, I've never seen this, but maybe it's the original. I had the, the lowest expectations for this. I, I really did. As low as it could get, that's how low it was. I was thinking about what happened with Rough Mix, which was a total disaster. So, I'm actually pleasantly surprised by this one. First of all, the, the pressing is good. This is, this is done at Jeezy Media. And it's it's a very very good pressing. When I hear people complaining about GZ, I don't know what they're complaining about. I've had only good luck from GZ Media, and believe me, the copies they get are not like like hand picked and checked. So the pressing quality is very good. The timbral balance of this version is very good. It's better than the original American Decca. If that's all you've ever heard and you heard this, you'd think this was better. So it's better in that regard. Uh, but you can hear, I'm sorry, you can hear th that, it's, it's, that it's a digitized file. That you're hearing a digitized uh, source because the picture is flat. There's no three-dimensionality. The original, not the original, but any of the great reissues, there's three-dimensionality. Roger Daltrey's voice stands out in, 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 in space, and it's focused. There's a person standing there, and you hear that person on this version, everything's across a flat plane, and everything. I mean, it's just it's just like a, like a shower curtain hung up, and everything's projected on that shower curtain, and uh, it's not satisfying. It's it's okay. It, it's the best of this uh, genre that I've heard of a digital file cut at half speed. It's clear. It's clean. It's not bad. Uh, when you hear Bargain, Bargain's an interesting song because there's like this tambourine on Bargain that seems to be from a different time zone. Even on the original, American, which sounds, you know, murky and filmy and dull, the tambourine shows up. It's almost like on the floor. It's weird. It's like right over there. There's this tambourine, and it's really clean, e even on the original. And every one of those hits is like, oh, it's right over there. And you can hear the zills on the tambourine. On this one, this new one... It's in that place, and it is it got that same quality. That I don't understand how that happened. It would be interesting to talk to Glenn Johns if he'd ever talk to me again. I don't know if he ever would, but um, how, how they did that. But on this one, it it doesn't. You don't hear each of those little things clearly. I can't explain that either. So all I'm going to say to you is, this is the best of this half speed mastered from a digital file that I've heard. It's pretty good. It's not bad. So as I recall, I bought this. I, w I wasn't given a promo of it. I think they realized I 
I'm not a big fan of you, so w why give it to me? But actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say better things about it than than they were expecting me to say. It's still not 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 the way I would do it. If you compare this to the classic records version or the heavy vinyl one that MCA did in 1995, this doesn't doesn't cut it compared to those. So it's it's a missed opportunity as far as I'm concerned. If you bought it and you like it, fine. You just don't know what you're missing, and um, the cover art is well done, and it's not bad. So I'm hoping that uh, that Analog Productions can license this title and do it from the tape or get the classic records metal parts and do it at 33 and maybe do a UHQR at 45 because if any uh, this is one of the greatest rock records ever made as far as I'm concerned and if they could do this at 45 and do a UHQR it's worth 150 bucks for that title but even if they don't get that and they just have the 33 the, the, the classic records 33 you play these two back to back maybe I'll go to a show and do that maybe I'll go to a show and I'll bring this, the one that I was involved with from 1995, and play that compared to this, and you'll hear it. All right, that's my deep dive into who's next, and um, no records were hurt in the, in the making of this video. And now I'm going to make some tea for myself and uh, recover from COVID. Okay, thanks for watching. I'm the same.